And how am I how am I able to celebrate Father's Day? Why am I able to do that, girls? Because you are our dad. Because you girls exist, right? So it's your day too. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to today's Hi. video. Today I have Harvey Johnson with me. I'm just gonna give you a 20 second background on Harvey. He is a really good friend of mine and I met him in graduate school at UC Berkeley uh, where we both ended up getting our PhDs and Harvey is one of my closest friends there. Uh, we actually spent quite a bit of time together, uh, definitely a confidant. And there's a couple of amazing things about Harvey and I'll share two with you. Uh, one is when I was getting to know Harvey, um, our minds think so differently. So when Harvey would say something, I was often really confused by what he would say. Um, but I, it was like learning a different language almost. And, and I really loved kind of learning a new way of thinking from Harvey. So thank you very much for that, Harvey. And another thing about Harvey, Harvey now is a teacher at St. Andrews where he went to boarding school. And he told me about this really cool thing he does. Um, and I'll let him tell you more about it. But for me, it was just wonderful because it's, it's addressing something in himself and it's a way of treating other people with kindness. Uh, Harvey, I'll let you talk about it. I think the way you led into it was that you have a low level, anxiety, level of anxiety uh, about, about talking to people. And then you've done this like really cool, beautiful thing and you have this, um, this, is it a litany? I don't know what you would call it. Yeah, I think I would, uh, if, if there are meditators in your audience, they might know it as either meta meditation or loving kindness. Um, but basically, uh, I when, when Sam and I were in Berkeley a long time ago, um, uh, I learned to meditate and it was a breath-based meditation um, where you're trying to just concentrate and focus on your breath. And then more recently, um, I've been trying, I went on my first, uh, meditation retreat, um, and I, I, I you know, I, I'd never done that before, and I learned a, a other brands of meditation, and one, one's called, uh, Metta, or Loving Kindness, and so, I guess, probably, maybe about a year ago, I started doing more Loving Kindness meditation, and, and the, you could come up with your own phrases, but basically, you try to bring to mind someone uh, maybe that you care about it could be uh, a pet or you know yourself or it could be uh, a loved one like a, a spouse or mom or a child um, and once you have that person in your mind um, you send them love basically so um, you can choose the the phrases that that work best for you but um, the classic ones that Sharon Salzberg um, recommended um, uh, to me when I first learned about it, uh, and you know to many in her book um, uh, Is you could start with uh, may you be safe May you be healthy may you be happy and may you live with ease and when you do that enough in on your cushion You know in, in the silence of your house um, You your the idea in meditation is that you're you're building the muscles of some sort and, and this this is the the way to build loving kindness or compassion and um uh, or you know, some people talk about friendliness, uh, if that if loving kindness is too c complex a phrase. Um, but somehow you're you're stretching your muscles of friendliness, let's say, and um, and when you do that for yourself, you get certain kinds of outcomes. Um, but the proof of meditation is always in the experience of of my life, um, and so I do what I do on the cushion, but then just like you work out in the gym and then you go out and you play a sport or you, you live your life, you, um, you, you see, you know, how has how that workout helped you? And for me, the surprising result was that it helped, that loving kindness practice really helped me um, in those moments of anxiety of interacting with people. Um, so like, uh, you know, if you're in a difficult, say, conversation with a colleague or maybe a boss at work, um, and you're starting to feel the anxiety kind of rise up. Um, that's a moment I, I just found myself, you know, just sort of reflexively um, offering these phrases of loving kindness to this person. Um, and it was it was a really uh, 
you know, it's a surprising thing, but yeah, I, I guess you shouldn't be surprised that if you practice something, you know, that becomes the habit of your mind. Um, and so, um, in this case, when I started offering this, 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 these moments of anxiety, just sort of really connecting with that person, um, saying, you know, may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be happy, may you be at peace, you know, silently, obviously, I'm not a, that much of a freak <laughs> to say it out loud, um, but uh, offering those people those kinds of, that love, you know, that, that the friendliness, um, uh, sort of silently, uh, as I listened, it helped me open up to them and, uh, you know, hear what they're saying. Um, I think, I think they, you know, w when you do that enough, you really, I feel like it's a way to, to be in the moment, um, more fully. Uh, so it's not just about sending love from your heart. It's actually, a way to really show up for that moment. Um, so you're sort of short circuiting those inner thoughts patterns about, Oh, am I saying the wrong thing? Or am I, you know, did I just, uh, did I just mess up there or whatever you get out of your own head and, and you, you, you reconnect with the relationship, um, of, in that moment. And so, uh, I think the, the receiver of that, feels that to you know, feels totally and that's the part that i wanted to share about you is you know if i i imagined what if i was the student and uh at saint andrews where you're teaching at uh, boarding school um, so i imagine if i'm a student and one of my teachers in their own head they're thinking uh, may you be safe to me and of course they're not saying those words but i'm sure i'm tuning in to some element of that and for me, as a student, one thing I loved about school is I just felt supported by certain teachers. And to me, what could be more supportive than a teacher thinking in their own head along the lines of may you be safe and other supportive thoughts that you have. Uh, so that's something I just really loved. And this, this is something, it sounds like Harvey started it in grad school, um, but I, I think I didn't really kind of tune into that you were doing this until well after grad school, until just uh, I think about a year or two ago. And it really stuck with yeah, me, man. So thanks for sharing that with me. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've matured a lot. I mean, it's funny when we age. I, I had the, when I was a kid, I used to think, you know, you're fully formed at some age and then, you know, that's it. Um, but I've learned like, you know, this evolution that happens, personal evolution, just keeps, it keeps unfolding, you know, and um, that's hopeful, I think, for us old guys. <laughs> but uh, yeah, when I was in grad school, I was doing the, the more heady kind of meditation where you're, you, you, you're thinking about what is the nature of consciousness? What's the nature? Well, how, how is it that I'm here at all? How is there, is the hard problem of consciousness more I was interested in and you know, the problem of, is there a self, um, like more heady mm -hmm. kind of meditation. Mm -hmm. I wasn't connecting with my heart in, in, in very, you know, not in a practice, not, not practicing at least on the cushion trying to connect with my heart. Um, and so I think the loving kindness, um, oh, there's a, there's a whole host of, you know, subset of, of meditations for those, anyone interested, uh, you know, Sam, you, if you want these links, I'd be happy to share resources about this, but, um, yeah, there's, there's, a uh, it's, there's a lot of, you know, heart practices basically, yeah. um, that, yeah, I don't think you probably <laughs> got to feel that. But one thing I want to say to build on the, your point of um, um, of like my students, um, I have this what I put the I'm a math teacher, and the equation I put on the board on the first day is um, love equals attention equals mindfulness, and I think that's the most important math equation I use all year. Um, but um, it connects to what I was just saying about being present. Um, so like you might think that, um, you might think that love is different than attention, right? Like love is this, you know, in our culture, we're taught that like love is what you see in romantic comedies, you know, and it's like, Oh, it could be gushy or whatever it is, but I, I prefer the more expansive definition of love, which is really more about just the way that we show up for others or the way the universe shows up for us. Uh, in some sense, the, just the, the fact that there is something and not nothing is, is, is in a way the universe loving itself. Um, and so love equals attention equals mindfulness 
is sort of trying to express the same concept that the fact of reality <laughs> or the fact of consciousness, it might me being conscious of talking to you now, Sam, um, is just the way I'm loving you. I'm giving you attention. I'm loving you. You know, if, as long if I'm mindfully present, I'm aware of that love. Um, and so that's why I talk about, you know, this equation and that's what I start with. Um, but it's related to the idea of expressing loving kindness to a person in the moment of being with them too. Yeah. And, uh, I have to wrap my head around a little more the whole equation thing, but certainly from the perspective of what's the what's my most important asset to me, and it, the answer is my attention, by far, right? It's like it's the one thing that whatever you can only focus on one thing at a moment in this moment, and that's your attention is on it, and to me that's my most valuable asset, and so whenever I'm sharing that with someone, it's like oh I'm sharing my most valuable asset, which is my attention. And I think that, um, you know, I, I'm personally not a parent, but I've seen enough parents and I have parents and attention was the one resource we were always clamoring for, right? Or your, your pets, right? Your pets want your attention. They don't need it 24 seven, but man, they really want it a lot, right? And, and I'm sure your yeah. daughters don't need your attention all the time, but I'm also sure that they're clamoring for your attention a lot of the time. And so to me, oh, yeah. I definitely am aware of how important attention is. And attention is so important that I've heard that there's plenty of evidence that kids would rather have uh, what I'm gonna call negative attention. So where uh, an adult is like yelling at them or just at least interacting with them, but in a pretty like mean, nasty way, kids prefer that to no attention. Um, and that's not, yeah. you know, 100%. I'm sure if you yell at a kid, the kid's going to go away. But <laughs> given the choice of absolutely zero attention or negative attention, on average, kids will choose negative attention. That's how important attention is to us as beings. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, I, the attention equals love. I definitely think there's a lot of value in thinking about that. Um, the other one, mindfulness, man, I I think if, if I asked 100 people, what do you mean by mindfulness, I might get a lot of different answers. <laughs> Because I remember yeah. a, a, I was focused on mindfulness about seven years ago a lot and one of my good friends is like, oh God, that's that's disgusting and and he was all about the heart. <laughs> he He felt like the heart was where he was headed in his own journey and I didn't really get much information from him. I didn't understand what he was saying and to this day I don't. Um, but I am curious about that, how it, it did seem like they were... You, you know, you're either mindful and you're in your head or you're not <laughs> mindful and you're in your heart. And I, I still don't understand that. So maybe you could help me with that. Yeah, I'm going to totally, I'll totally <laughs> attempt it because I'll accept a chance to practice, you know, the skill any day, any, you know, as often as possible. Um, but I'm going to butcher <laughs> it. Um, uh, but I would just say that, um, uh, so like maybe if you think about like a black lab, um, they're totally present. Um, and I'm, right now I'm channeling Joseph Goldstein, who's a, who's what my teacher in a way, I mean, I've never met him, but he, he, I follow a lot of his videos. I read a lot of his books and, um, he's a 10% happier meditator, uh, teacher, guide, whatever you want to call him. Um, and he talks about this when he talks about mindfulness. So consider a, like a black lab, um, you would say the black lab is present and certainly seeking attention, maybe present for every moment of that black lab's life. I'm not sure what it's like to be a black lab, obviously, but I can probably like simulate it, you know, that it's, it's, let's, let's assume the camera's on and the, then the film is rolling <laughs> if you're a black lab. Um, but you're, you're maybe not going to grant the black lab much metacognitive skill, like thinking about thinking. Um, so, so I think when you talk about mindfulness, maybe it's simply put, you know, are you aware that you're aware? Uh, are you lost in thought? Like maybe the black lab is or lost in experience or are you 
are you aware that this is happening? <laughs> that you're a being in the world and that you could do otherwise? Okay, so your definition of mindfulness of is an awareness of your own being in the sense that, oh, I'm having thoughts. And just the idea that I have thoughts is a mindfulness that, say, a black lab wouldn't have. They don't have a prefrontal cortex. So they're just experiencing and they're amazed, but they're not like, oh, I'm a, I'm a being that's having these thoughts of amazement. Okay. That's right. Yeah, I, that's that's how I think about it. And and when you when you grant yourself mindfulness, when you realize you're a being that has my, that can be mindful, that that doesn't have to merely react to stimuli, um, you actually get a some separation uh, between the emotional experience of your life and your reactivity. So like, if there's a gap, if there's a mindful, let's call it a mindfulness gap between what you're experiencing and what you're doing or what you, how you're reacting to it, um, that, the greater that gap, the more chance that you can become equanimous, um, have maybe be non-reactive, you know. You, there are moments, of course, that you want to react mindfully. Well, I, I just but, want to um, quickly define equanimous for the listener. Equ oh, yeah. Equanimity is when you have calmness uh, regardless of what's going on or around you, regardless of what you're feeling. So let's say... Yeah, your parents say hi to Sam. Hi, Hello. Sam. Is that Maya? This is my daughter. You want to say your name? I'm oh, Leela. Leela, we've met. Do you remember meeting Sam? Do you remember meeting him? No, no. She was, was very, very little. little. <laughs> But um, I like your new pajamas. You went to bed with different oh, pajamas. Oh, there's Maya. And I'm, I was hot. You were hot? You're hot. And how about Hi, Maya? Maya. Maya's hot. <laughs> oh my gosh, Maya looks so much like Nemo. Can yeah. I hear? Oh, you want to hear again? What did he say? Here, say it again, Sam. Hold on, put your, put your, yeah, these girls want to, okay. <laughs> you want to put this one in your ear? Hi, Maya. He's saying hi, Maya. Hi, Leela. Okay. Hi. Can you please get off uh -oh. my lap? <laughs> okay. All right, sweetie. Now you can go on. Yeah. But now you want to try to get back on now? <laughs> so Maya is four. She just turned four. And Leela, how old are you, Leela? How, um, here you go. Do you want me to talk? Mm. Hi. Hi. <laughs> So these are my sweeties. It's Father's Day officially. Oh, still. Father's Day today. That's so right. These, these, Happy Father's Day. Yeah, Harvey. these are. Yeah, these. Are, I guess the audience probably won't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, these are. So we talk. Call. So here's here's yes, the new. It, yes, it's still Father's Day. And how am I? How am I able to celebrate Father's Day? Why am I able to do that, girls? Because you are our dad. Because you girls exist, right? So it's your day too, <laughs> right? And this is the idea of inner interbeing, interdependence, right? Is so, this a rock? so nothing arises independently. Is this a rock? Um, what's that? Not a rock. That's so funny, Harvey. You're like giving them advanced concepts, and they're like, "This is a rock." You see, you see, I'm funny. Sam is funny, right? Your dad is funny. <laughs> he cracks me up. All right, well, girls, you you are past your bedtime, right? We should probably go back to bed. Hmm? You want to say anything to Sam before you go? <laughs> Are you guys having a good summer? Yeah. Are you having a good yeah, summer? Good summer. Hold on, don't, don't, don't hit anything. Are you guys in... Sh Leela, are you having a good summer? Are you having a good summer, he's asking. Yeah. Where are we? Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, girls. They're, I, they're, I wanna, I wanna, um, I wanna finish my call. Okay. And 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 daddy. Yeah. Who is his name? Sam, Uncle Sam. But not the one that's gonna take all your okay. money. Um, can I tell not you that Uncle Sam. Something. When you start getting paycheck. I'm telling you something. When I told you that. That's what? They are. 
That's him. That's him. He has a white. He has a white yep. headphone. It's my headphone. Yeah. Um, his white headphone looks like your headphone. Oh yeah, we have white headphones too. We're not using. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Did they even you? <laughs> Girls, how about you go lay down and remember? You know what you can do if you wanna go to sleep, right? What do you need to do? Can you put two headphones in? Hey, sweetie, listen. Can what do you need to do? What do we do before I we like go to sleep? I like your shirt. Thank you. I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we do. What we do before Okay. Bed. Do you want to tell Sam one thing before you go? What do you want to teach him? We're te- we're talking about important things. So, what would be one thing you would tell him? Um. Can I just ask him a question? You just want yeah, to ask yeah. Him a ask me a question. Than tell him. Okay. Yeah. Ask him a question. Does he have any kids? I do not have any kids. No I don't kids. have any kids. My sisters both have kids. I have two sisters, and one sister has a son and a daughter. Sister? Yeah. And I have another sister who has a daughter. Not a sister? Oh. So he's a happy uncle dad. Yeah, I'm an uncle. Said I'm an uncle. For you. Happy Uncle's Day for you, says Maya. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me get my headphones and give me kisses. Give me hugs. Give me hugs and go to bed. Can I say one more thing? Okay, say one last thing. Um, talk about right, you want to talk about right speech? Is that the White House? That's the Lincoln Memorial. Is that the White House? No, that's not his White House. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Girls, go on to bed. You're past your bedtime, sweeties. Go out there. And I'm going to play with you tomorrow. Like, this is why we need to get, get good sleep. But Dada. Yeah. I told you that. Is he going to go to sleep? Sam, are you sleeping I well sleep these days? wonderfully, yeah. You're sleeping wonderfully. Um, I'll go to sleep in about four hours because I'm on the West Coast, so it's two hours earlier. He's on the west coast, so it's two hours earlier. Um, so. Hi. hi. Um, I want to tell you that Jane wants to Icarus. I mean, I mean, I grandma and I grandma is here. Oh, your grandma's, grandma's here. Is here. Which grandma? Harvey's mom or Nemo's mom? You your mom's mean? mom or your dad's mom? It's Nemo. Oh, okay. Oh, Grand- wonderful. I mean, Amama is my mama's mom. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Amama is another way to say mom's mom in Telugu, right? That's the Indian language. And Harvey, we're getting to that point where you probably need to turn that light on. Yeah. It's getting a little... There we go. Um, who turned it on? Daddy turned it Yeah. Daddy. Okay, so... Uncle Sam wanted to talk to me, sweeties. I've been um, enjoying talking to you two as well. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to put it on Sam. <laughs> um, but this is like um, one of those things where like, you know how I have phone calls sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, so that's where, you know, when I say like, this is a time where I have to probably just talk to the students. Yeah. Yeah, so Sam is like a student in a way. And I'm like a student. He's like a teacher and I'm like a teacher. <laughs> but Sound is good? he really a teacher? Sam's a teacher. But then why did you say he's like a teacher? Well, we're all students and teachers. <laughs> <laughs> you have a father who's okay. very existential. You don't want me to make noises. <laughs> okay. Do you guys want to go upstairs? You ready? Do you want to say bye bye? I think they want to. I think they want to stay up all ever. night, Harvey. Yeah, I guess we can keep going. I mean, if you want to just try to do this with them, I don't know. I'm holding the iPhone up with a stapler on a cardboard box. Why can't you give it back well, to me? why don't you introduce yeah, your two daughters to the viewers? Okay, yeah, so this now. is... You could hear it now. So this is Maya, right? Maya, do you remember your whole name? Or no? Um, Mila wants to hear something. Okay, yeah, Lila and Maya. So Maya's name means... 
material, matter, maya, and, and material, and all these other mass, these kinds of words, um, share a same root, and it means the stuff of the world. And uh, lila means play, divine play. So the universe came about, it needed stuff, and it needed the playfulness of the gods to make reality happen, and so that's why we chose Maya and Leela. Um, I kind of had it in my head that Leela was like the story. Yeah, so, okay. right, so so if you go back, I think the way I talked about it with you one time was, um, if you, you contrast the Western, like, Christian myth around the creation of the universe, and it would be about <laughs> Leela. I just want to let him hear, I want to let him hear himself. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, um, so the creation mythology around, oh, 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 Leela. What me? Why are you doing me? Okay, sorry. Maya, Maya. Okay, girls, now you will have to go upstairs, I think. Okay? No. High five. Please. Okay, well then you have to sit still. Okay. Okay. Try to ask the universe to sit still. Um, so, um, yeah, so the Christian uh, uh, creation story, you might remember, it's like, I don't remember it perfectly, but basically it's something like uh, uh, we lost our chance to live in wonderful Eden, perfect, you know, paradise forever because someone ate a apple and uh -huh. that cast us out. And then, uh, um, yeah, and that's a downer. I think that's a bummer, no, you know, like that story is, is uh, not great. And then, but I love the, the, the uh, Asian, like South Asian Still. Buddhist, you could say Indian um, creation story, which, which uh, conjures up the universe just as an act of divine play. So the gods wanted to play, they're playful. We are here, everything is here because gods are playing. Uh, I see. Which is, which oh is yeah, more, nature's uh, playground. That's that was a yeah. big concept I came with, or that struck me many years ago. I was like, this is just nature's playground. How yeah, wonderful. it connects to some of those questions about like, is this a simulation? What's the chance that this is a simulation? And uh, ooh, is it so quiet? ooh, yeah. let's let's jump into that. Um, yeah. Since since you brought that up, uh, so really Jeez, quickly, I can't make it louder because. Um, what I'm going to tell my viewers is that the simulation hypothesis is that we're living in an actual simulation so that this reality is not real and we're in the simulation. And the argument for why this is a realistic, uh, or this is a high probability event, it's a much higher probability we're living in a simulation than not, is because if you imagine that you know, we're, we're making video games, for example, that are getting more and more realistic. And the characters in those video games are getting more and more complex. And at some future point, the characters in those video games might be pretty similar to us and might have some level of self-awareness. So if that's true... If that's true... Yes, there you go. <laughs> so if that's true, if it's true that we create... Um, beings in a simulation, then what are the odds that we're the first creatures ever to come into existence and then we create these simulations that have beings in them? Uh, the odds are, you know, we're going to create tons of these simulations, you know, just like they're... Haha, -ha, I knew that would... <laughs> Oh, that's that's hilarious, man. That's hilarious. I love that uh, we we got two adults speaky for them. Still downstairs with us in the other world. Okay, can you please go to bed and close the door too, please, Maya? Thank you. Good night, Maya. Maya. Doesn't listen. <laughs> I think I locked the door, so I won't have any more fun like that. <laughs> uh, well, and it's okay because whenever I'm talking, I can mute your audio on the um, in the editing software. So that's why I was just kind of talking through it. 
the yeah, yeah, thread yeah, I was good. on is, let's say we do create a simulation that's advanced enough that the beings inside the simulation become self-aware. They don't necessarily know they're in a simulation unless we tell them. So if we choose not to tell them and they're in a simulation, and then we create, heavens knows how many simulations. So let's just put the order at hundreds of billions or hundreds of trillions of simulations. Just like on Earth right now, just because someone makes a video game doesn't mean there's only one instance of that video game. There might be millions of instances of that video game at any given moment. And so what are the odds then that we are not in a simulation? And the answer is like, it's a pretty low probability event that we're not in a simulation. Uh, it's far more likely that we're we're in a simulation and it's also more likely that we're in a simulation that's within a simulation that's within a simulation. <laughs> yeah. And so just from a probability event, I'm not saying that I believe it, uh, but if you just think statistically, what are the odds that we're the original creators of simulations? Uh, the odds are pretty low that we're the original creators of simulations. And once we start creating simulations, those simulations could in fact create simulations. I'm not articulating this super well. No, no, you're, yeah, you, but I just think you nailed it, yeah. Probability event. So what are your thoughts on the living in a simulation? Yeah, I mean, I'm just so, um, I feel like this is a great example of a question that um, uh, it inspires awe, I think, and it inspires curiosity and it inspires questions. And I love these kinds of questions, which are generative of more questions, uh, more questions than answers. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's just a beautiful kind of way of thinking. And um, rather than give an answer, I think it's appropriate to just be respectful of the thinking that had to go into thinking about that. And, uh, you know, there's like you, you know, we talked once about um, how useful is logic to to convince another person or as a way of finding out about the truth. And, um, you know, and I agree with you at the time you told me that often people don't agree on the starting assumptions. And I think this is a case where, um, you really need to be clear about the starting assumptions. Um, and the problem Actually, is, a quick sorry. aside. Uh, so what Harvey's referring to is we had a conversation and I said logic and reasoning is pretty much worthless if you don't agree on the basic assumptions then logic gets you nowhere in having a discourse or a conversation about something. Logic is only helpful at discovery if you agree on all the underlying assumptions and I think of reasoning as the same as logic roughly that you know reasoning is a form of logic and so the conversation we had is that basically uh, logic and reasoning are useless as forms of interacting with people and trying to persuade or um, discuss topics unless you agree on all the basic assumptions. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is like one of these um, great <laughs> examples of how important assumptions are. So like, you know, one of the, I'm not a, I'm not a philosopher. Um, you know, I love philosoph philosophical questions, but I'm guessing that there's a lot being smuggled in with um in this in this in this kind of thinking um when we smuggle in consciousness into simulations um and so since we don't understand the hard problem of consciousness already at the level of our experience um it's it's really hard to then say what it would take to get conscious beings within a simulation. So I'm guessing a lot of the work of this thought experiment, it, it happens um, in that set of assumptions about what is consciousness and how do you get it to take place in a simulation? Yeah, and another philosophical question is, can you have a universe without consciousness? And I think when we're kids, we all think yes, the answer is yes, that the universe exists, all this matter was here, the stars formed, uh, then planets formed from exploding supernova, and you know, all these things happened, the Big Bang happened ancient times ago, and then things popped into existence, or life popped into existence, and then those things that popped into existence evolved and evolved and evolved until they got to these creatures that had some level of consciousness. 
um, you know, more complex creatures. And certainly humans are an example of a conscious creature. Um, we're not the only conscious creature. Uh, so to me, that was the way I thought about it. And I think most kids do think of things that way. And then some philosophers and even f physic, uh, physicists even think that, well, you actually can't have these things without an observer. And the observer, for a physicist, the observer is a conscious being. And for a philosopher, certain philosophies, it's like, well, without consciousness, this actually can't exist. And that's pretty interesting to wrap your head around. <laughs> yeah. Is like, <laughs> could it exist without, without conscious observers? And right. it's, it's unknown what the answer is. Yeah, I mean, this now we're getting, I mean, we already were deep, but this is really deep. I, I um, you know, when we talk about like Hugh Everett's many worlds hypothesis, um, or just like, just even, you know, any, any interpretation of quantum phenomena, like is just so fascinating. Um, but yeah, I, I think, it, yeah, it's a great example. Like I, I, I actually don't know what to believe about what's the right interpretation of the measurement problem. Is that, is that the measurement problem, Sam? Or is that a different, what's the, what's the class of problem that we're talking about if we say, um, uh, Hugh Everett's many worlds is a solution or, um, or the Copenhagen interpretation is a solution. What's the, what's the problem there? Is that the many worlds or no? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyway. So these are these solutions, uh, to the question, um, uh, no matter which one you pick, I guess there's always an observer. Um, and <laughs> so I, I think that's related to your point. I, I love the many worlds hypothesis. Um, and, uh, clearly in that case too, uh, an observer is critical. Well, and but. let me guess what you mean by the many worlds hypothesis. Uh, so in quantum physics, uh, you can, certain things can happen and only one thing does happen. So I'll just give you a quick example is uh, a really basic um, quantum physics experiment is what's called the double slit experiment. And it's where you send a small particle like a photon or an electron through um, these, this two slit apparatus. And what happens is it seems like it goes through one slit or the other, but the way quantum physics works is it somehow knows that there's two slits, even though it only travels through one. And one of the uh, hypotheses, is, uh, hypotheses is that it actually goes through both slits, but it creates two different worlds. So suddenly there's one world where the observation, the experiment was when it went through slit A, and another world just came into, popped into existence, and that observer or that experiment observed that the photon went through slit B. And so that at every moment you have so many new worlds, not an infinite number of new worlds, by the way, an actual finite number. Um, so you have a finite but very large number of worlds <laughs> being created in every single moment. And so then a, a, um, a many worlds hypothesis, I think what you're talking about, Harvey, is that yeah. everything that can happen does happen. And it just happens in an alternate universe or alternate world and so there's another world where Harvey and I are having this same conversation and Harvey uh, started yelling right like that's a possibility <laughs> and so that happened in in one world and we're just in the world where that didn't happen is that the many worlds hypothesis that you're <laughs> referring to <laughs> is that what you're referring to by the many worlds yeah, that's right Sam okay that's right. got it you nailed it yeah, I think it is called the measurement problem um, but yeah it's uh, yeah, so uh, I guess um, it relates. All these things relate, but I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm worried. I'm worried that I've taken this a little too, too physicsy now. Uh, no, I, actually, brings me to another question. Now I knew when I asked you to do this interview that we would get heady because one of the reasons I wanted to uh, bring Harvey to your attention is every time I have a phone call with Harvey, we. I don't think our intention is to get deep about. <laughs> philosophy, um, ontology, uh, why, why does existence happen? What is consciousness? I don't think we intend to, but we, I think because both of us look into that sort of stuff and there's so few people that are even interested or want to talk about that, that we end up having almost every, every conversation, we end up getting into some level of that stuff. Yeah, it's true. Um, I, 
I think you're right, actually, about the reason why. I mean, basically, I've bored everyone else out of my existence. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, for some reason, Sam stuck around, and now he's subjecting you to it. <laughs> well, and the greatest thing is, as soon as I started talking about this stuff, your girls were like, nope. You know, it was all fun when we were just goofing around, but as soon as we got heady, your, your daughters were... Uh, yeah. A question I'd like to ask you is... Um, this is one that actually no one's given me an answer on yet. So yeah. no pressure. If you don't have an answer, that's totally fine. It actually took me quite a while to come up with answers to this question. Sure, but I think yeah. it's a beautiful question. Yeah, what, what is an important truth almost no one agrees with you on? It's a great question. Um, I teach problem solving in math and, and I always like to create a what I perceive to be a simpler question that maybe is related and try to answer that first when I'm solving problems. Um, so um, maybe a related question is, what is a truth that's counterintuitive to me? And, and, and when I first heard it, didn't I, maybe I didn't believe it or I didn't fully um, take on board the full ramifications of it. Um, and so the first one for me like that was evolution. Um, and I don't know what percentage of the world believes in evolution at this point, but um, I was a religious person growing up, um, and I I think I did like believe it intellectually that evolution was true when I first heard it heard about it. I'm talking about um, Darwinian evolution um, uh, with natural selection or through natural selection, um, and uh, the full weight of the truth of evolution didn't really hit me until grad school, Sam. I, I don't know if you knew that about me, but I, um, I learned about evolution as a, I guess I must have been a ninth grader, and the implications of evolution, what would that be? I mean, seven, like at least 10 years after learning about evolution. Um, so I, either I'm slow or that's like a very, um, gnarly truth <laughs> takes its time to really unfold um and uh so that would be like a related question um i don't know how many people believe about believe in evolution but that's one that um i i think you know is, is is as true as it gets and um i'm not sure how many people understand that um uh i could give you another one um sorry I, I so what's Buddhism, the what's the important truth that no one would agree on if you had to I guess it, it would be that um, we are evolved, uh, human beings and all other organisms are evolved uh, through natural select, through mutation and natural selection. If there is a creator, it's certainly not inconsistent with the idea of evolution. So you, you're comfortable with the idea that, so you think evolution is pretty much how, how we got here, and it's possible that there is a divine creator Oh, that yeah, is, completely. That is full on interacting with uh, creation and evolution and all these different things that we're experiencing. That a divine being or a divine creator could could exist. And you're just focused on, hey, there there's stories in the Bible that if you take them literally, they don't stack up. Yeah, and, with and our for, observations. I, mean, I would go even for, I think I would go even further. Like I'm not you don't even have to be a literalist about the Bible, but if 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 God is real uh, certainly God would understand evolution and, and God would want to send, he would, why not send your son fully intact with a, a modern account of evolution and a modern account of quantum mechanics. I mean, if you really want to impress upon, you don't do miracles turning water into wine. If you're God, right? You, you, the, 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 the standard of evidence that you would want to present should should accord with a, a modern telling of of the the of, of what is true about reality and one of one of those things that's true is evolution yeah so you don't go around doing david copperfield style magic tricks to prove that you're the creator right you 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 might as well talk about evolution talk about you know wave functions right <laughs> like you might as well like fully reveal uh, the magic of reality um if you if you're if you really are God, right, or the Son of God, however you want to talk about that. Yeah, this comes to something about the human mind that I've been fascinated with. So, some people, including myself, including you, uh, were very skeptical of things, 
and you know we do take leaps of faith but on average we like to see a lot of information before we sort of accept something into our um, mental state and one of the biggest teachings of religion that that I didn't associate with as a child or didn't resonate with me at all was this concept of faith and that you that a good like I was raised to believe a good Christian has faith and God doesn't need to prove anything to you like you you actually on the other hand have to have faith in God and and there's a lot of pride people had in faith and that teaching is is um, really hammered home and I think there's an unfortunate byproduct of that. And the unfortunate byproduct, in my opinion, is that people mistake having faith for mistaking having beliefs in other things without any evidence. So for example, I saw recently an interview of a woman and she said Barack Obama was a terrorist, a Muslim, and you can never convince me otherwise. Oh, and he, his birth certificate was faked, like he was not born a US citizen. And the interviewer just asked her, so no, no amount of evidence to the contrary could ever convince you otherwise. And she was like, absolutely not. I can't tell you why I believe it, but I believe it and you could never convince me otherwise. And to me, I think that's a spillover in the human mind of this idea of like, I have faith in our creation story and I don't need any evidence. And my faith is so strong that no matter what you show me, I'm going to continue holding on to my faith of this creation story of God and Jesus and you, you can't convince me otherwise because I, my faith is so strong and my Christianity is so strong and it, it's such a beautiful story and then unfortunately I think that same rationale flips into other aspects of someone's life mm. in that case that woman is like no matter what you do or say you're not going to stop my belief system and to me I couldn't feel more differently like my beliefs are totally changeable I, my beliefs are not immutable by any stretch. Basically, if there's any moment where I can see, oh, that belief system is actually far more realistic or better or superior in some way to my current beliefs, or maybe this having this belief system would lead to a healthier version of me, you know, I'm happy to drop old beliefs like an old hat. And yeah. it's such a strange thing to me to see uh, this human characteristic of holding on to beliefs as if they're true regard despite all the facts right yeah um, and I do yeah. wonder if it comes from that religion or that religious teaching of have faith no matter what or if that religious teaching came from the fact that some people's minds really like to hold on to beliefs firmly hmm. despite all evidence to the contrary yeah yeah, it's interesting. That's that's a really good that's a really good question about the what is what is the role of faith? How did did it, is it an evolved trait? How did it come about? Um, and I I don't know. I mean, um, we could talk about Bayesian statistics a little bit here. Um, that that's been a you know st statistics as a class of mathematical problems is is such an interesting area for which you know we seem to be equipped with the intellectual capability of thinking through problems like that but we don't seem to be equipped with the, a set of heuristics or gut intuitions about how statistics works um, of, you know from an evolutionary perspective we seem to be able to learn it but not you know born with it <laughs> kind of thing um, and so we can talk about statistics the other way we might go is um, when we think about faith is to look at other religions. Um, so Christianity is um, is one which prizes faith as as, as a central virtue. Um, but Buddhism um, actually goes the other way, um, and I, I like to think of the Buddha as like actually a, one of the first, well, religious scientists, I guess. Um, but he basically, you know, in some of the writings, this is, there's the suggestion that. Um, uh, you you basically have to interrogate. Maybe that's not the right word for, but you know, think about, practice, challenge any claim that Buddhism uh, makes. You have to you have to you have to challenge it and, and see for yourself. Is, is it rather than is it skillful? Rather than work? blindly accepting. Yeah. yeah. So I think faith is. You know, the way I would say it is, I think faith is 
you know, I'm, I, I was raised in a Christian world, so like, you know, I don't know about maybe Judaism's like this too, or maybe Islam, but you know, there's definitely religions that can be, you know, more faithless, I think. And then, but yeah, we could also talk about the role of statistics and, and learning and, and, and ontology if you want. But um, yeah, I, I love thinking about this and actually, you know, actually maybe the reason I'm also bringing up Buddhism right now is it's another answer to your question of what's something that's true that um, not many people believe. Uh, I could give you another one if you want to hear a yeah, second yeah, answer. Yeah, let's hear it. Um, so there's something called the five remembrances in Buddhism. Um, and it was something that the Buddha recommended, again, recommended, not, not dictated, <laughs> uh, but recommended that we reflect on every day if we could. Um, and so the five remembrances are, and I might get these out of order, but basically, um, I'm, I'm a creature that will grow old. Um, you know, so I'll age. Um, I'm not, there's no, I'm not exceptional. <laughs> I will also age. Um, uh, I will, uh, get sick. Um, I'm not an exception to getting sick. Uh, I will die. Uh, I'm not an exception uh, to dying. Um, I will um, lose everyone I've ever cared about, and they will lose everyone they've ever cared about. Um, and so it will be separated from our loved ones, and I'm not exceptional there. And then the last one is I'm the inheritor, I inherit the fruits of my actions. So um, the actions that I do are basically my only belongings that those actions are sometimes it's said they're the womb <laughs> for the birth of my future self. Um, oh, so, cool. I like uh, that. So your actions, and I often talk about this is like you can only affect the present moment. And of course, yeah. things you do in the present moment will impact like butterfly effect into your future. But what you're saying is this kind of cool way to think about it that your actions right now are are the womb for your future self the birth of your future self yeah and so these are the five remembrances and i think any one of those i think they're all true and i think uh any one of them people maybe know intellectually but they don't actually live it i don't think they feel that viscerally and that's why the buddha recommended that we reflect on it often um, like we don't really live as if we're going to die. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we actually don't, um, we live as if we're going to be exceptions <laughs> like, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, I guess I'll die someday, but not, you know, that's not, yeah, know, it's a very nebulous really. concept far in yeah. the future and <laughs> yeah, it yeah. becomes more real yeah. when your parents die. Then it's like this, uh, I've heard yeah. this, um, this Russian woman I met in college said that your parents are like your shield. Like when your parents are alive, the thought of death is really vague and far away. So certainly well, like what you're saying is, you know, like, oh, I don't like death will happen and I'll die, but not really. Uh, but then yeah. when your parents die, it gets you one step closer. Like they're your last step between you and death. And so it gets less vague, right? Because you're next. Yeah. Like it's a very clear sign. And, and even, you know, when your grandparents die, when you're when you're young, like that's super far away. But when your grandparents die, that removes one little boundary. And so it becomes a little more real and tangible. And then if your parents die, then it's like that's the last shield. Yeah. And I think that, I don't know, I mean, people, if you polled them, would say, oh, yeah, of course it's true that I'm going to get sick. Or of course it's true that I'm going to, whatever it is, I'm going to pick any of the five. Um, but the what's interesting is like, when you actually do get sick, what do we do? We don't say, yes, of course, I'm getting sick. You know, you say, oh, why did I, why did I not wash my hands that time before I, you know, why did I, why do I touch my face so much or whatever it is, uh -huh. right? We, we don't, we actually come up with a story about how we got sick instead of being like, no, the, the cause of sickness is birth. The cause of death is birth. You know, the cause of old age is birth. And that, that's the cause. Like we're all heading down this conveyor belt and we, we think we can avoid it. Um, and of course we should, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not advocating that <laughs> don't vaccinate or something, right? Do your best to, 
to, and you should try to tell stories. Or, but try to not you touch feel, your face, you know, when you touch right, All these things surface. are good things. Hygiene is important. Like, I'm not saying that, especially during this pandemic. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, like, there's the relative and the ultimate level. And so on the relative level, we have these stories that are very important to us. And on the ultimate level, we're all atoms, and we're going to all return to atoms and maybe get reconstituted. Some of those atoms will be reconstituted into another human, you know. But um, I, I think um, it's just interesting to think about how we can live with this cognitive dissonance about the, the deep truths. Um, and, and, and not we can, we can know it, but not fully, you know, in your bones know it kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of an ignorance is bliss in that regard. Um, yeah. Like if you're not thinking about it, I think it is more blissful. Like if you're a child, it's pretty hard to even wrap your mind around this stuff. And then as you age... You know, you, you're, you're less ignorant, but it's also probably less blissful. Uh, well, that's interesting, Sam. So I, I would put, maybe this is another truth. Here we go. This is great. I love, this is such an amazing question you've asked me because I would say no. It's actually very freeing and almost blissful to fully take on board this, um, these truths. I'm, I get it. It sounds like a downer to, uh, to think, contemplate one's own death, but okay. um, I would, I've actually been surprised like how blissful it can be to, to fully uh, embrace one's death. Because um, let me give you an example to help, um, to help maybe feel less esoteric. Um, uh, there's this great um, book, it's called The Five Invitations by Frank Ostaseski. Uh, he was a uh, he. He was the um, uh, Zen. What, what do they call it? The San Francisco Zen Center, I believe. Uh, Zen Hospice Center, maybe it's called. Um, but he he was with dying people for many many years. I don't think he actually runs it anymore. But he Sorry. started it, I believe. I... Yeah. So Franco Stasewski um, uh, wrote this beautiful book, and he gives this example of um, the. So he says. Uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to quote it, but, um, basically he's talking about the the impermanence as an idea. Um, and, um, and he makes the argument. So he says impermanence, uh, sometimes called the law of change and becoming, um, and by some Buddhists, um, is the idea that, um, he goes on and says many things about impermanence, but he gives the example of, uh, imagine outside of his, um, uh, cabin, in Idaho are these blue beautiful blue flax flowers um, and they live he says for only one day they bloom and they die in one day and he he asks us to consider how much more beautiful is this blue flax flower um, than a plastic exact replica so if you could make the same blue flax flower but make it and make it exactly you know to the eye looks the same but it's a plastic replica and it'll live forever. How much more beautiful is the impermanent one? And, and that difference, the difference between the beauty of the blue flax that lives for a day is, is how much more beautiful our life is because of its impermanence, because we will die, because we will get sick. Um, and so that, when you say ignorance is bliss, I think you're right. Like when you first hear it, you're like, yeah, that's no good. I don't want to confront that. But then when you really take it on board, that we are these impermanent beings, that, that life is what it is because of impermanence, that change in becoming is, is actually what brings beauty. It, it breathes beauty into the, into the universe. Well, and, yeah, I think, I think it's actually quite And blissful. maybe if, well, and I was going to add a different word. So uh, ignorance is bliss. Um, and I, I stand by that because when you're a child and you're unaware, it's, it's blissful. And then you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that an awareness of our impermanence has a intrinsic beauty. Yeah, to that's it. right. That's right. And perhaps you could get to a blissful state in celebrating that beauty. Right. But I would say like the ignorance is bliss and then awareness is beauty. Maybe um, that's a better. And, and, yeah, maybe that's right. Yeah, I think you're I think you're I mean, the only the only problem is like when you don't when you I guess the this is another one where it's like there's the constellation of views that you have to also believe to make the thing you want to be true true <laughs> and so i'm not sure what kind of universe it would have to be where we actually do never die um it's well it seem, I, I, yeah go ahead in our lifetime harvey we will get to some form of that so hear me yeah, out yeah i i'm gonna uh, i'm very skeptical but go ahead so the 
the, there's a word that's used for a lot of things, but singularity is a word used in some circles for downloading the human consciousness mm -hmm. into a computer yeah. or the, the equivalent of a computer. And the, the current estimate based on Moore's law and Moore's law is that the amount of memory you fit on a chip doubles in size every year, whatever, you know, whatever Moore's law is, something like that. Basically our processing power, our computing power is getting stronger and stronger and um, we can put it on smaller and smaller chips. So based on that, if we keep going with, the, uh, and sorry, it's exponential. Yeah. So it's doubling every year. So it's exponential growth. And exponential growth is really hard to understand, sure. um, but it's fast, right? Sure. And so by 2045, which is only 25 years away, it's thought that we're going to be able to take your consciousness and put it into a computer. Now, the consciousness in the computer is not you, yeah. right? You're still you. But it is like a, a copy and paste yeah. of you. And so that version of you, ideal, I, like one idea is that you could put it to work, sure. right? You could, you could have 100 Harveys, you know, 10 of them are doing your financial <laughs> stuff all the time. Sure. And, you know, you could have one teaching your Zoom classes, sure. right? Like why have actual physical Harvey teaching your Zoom classes when you could have this copy doing that work for you? Sure. And so you could put all these beings to work but I wouldn't be able to distinguish, like if, if you wrote me an email or this copy and paste version wrote me an email, I wouldn't be able to distinguish between the two of you. Yes. Um, so, and, and none of us would know what it was like to be that, sure. that being that's in the yeah, computer. Yeah. So it's not like you're transferring your soul into the computer, that's not what's happening. Yeah. But you are taking something yep. of you and you're putting it in a digital form that can live on in perpetuity. Sure. And who knows what year it'll happen, yeah. um, but the, the thinking is that it, it will happen. If humans don't become extinct, it will happen. Yeah. Or if we don't sort of um, erase our technological advantages up to this point, yeah. if we keep advancing in technology, we'll get to this point where we can live in perpetuity. And I also think, probably not during your lifetime and my lifetime, unfortunately. I think we missed the boat. We're, we're a little too early. I don't know about the unfortunately, but, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. True. To, to the point you just made earlier, our impermanence is beautiful in itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, you and I, are, we're probably going to catch the boat on ex life extension, sure, yeah. right? Where just finding different ways to make our organs last longer yeah. and yada yada but there'll be problems associated with that yeah. right like dementia is a really hard problem to solve and the older you get the more likely you are to get alzheimer's yeah. so there's challenges but who's to say that a hundred years from now right. we we start having humans live sure. basically indefinitely yeah or maybe three thousand years right. who, who knows but at some future point maybe humans themselves so not just your copy and paste digital versions mm -hmm. But the physical being yeah. themselves can live indefinitely. And trust me, this isn't nearly as crazy as it sounds because there are jellyfish that yeah. they age yeah. and then they Benjamin Button. They reverse age yeah. and then they age and they reverse age. So they can get eaten, yeah. they can get killed, but they can also, if left, they, they can live literally indefinitely. Yeah. And I've heard the same of crocodiles, yeah. that there's actually no way to determine the age of a crocodile because there's no limit to a crocodile's lifespan. And so you, a crocodile can live indefinitely or at least a very, very long time. Yeah. Um, but for us to figure out like how do we Benjamin Button, how do we <laughs> mimic that, that uh, jellyfish, it, you know, the, the telomeres or the, yeah. the extra information on your DNA strands. I mean, like, we're already aware of a lot of the things that cause us to age. So to think that we won't be able to get to a point where we kind of figure out the aging process, sure. I think is, I think it makes way more sense that we'll figure it out than it does to, to believe that we won't. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot there. Like, I, I definitely, um, I guess I would say, like, so like one way to think about it, this may be a chance to talk about statistics a little bit. Um, one way to think about it is Harvey's a Harvey's a math teacher. <laughs> I think you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, like it. It would have to be the case that the universe was c constructed in such a way that there was a zero percent chance of death at any moment. 
Um, so to get, I'm not saying we can't get there. I'm just saying it's much more likely we won't get there because oh. as long as you're accruing, like if you say it's 99.99999, you know, like there, as long as it's not a hundred percent chance that we're going to live through every moment. Um, and as long as it's a hundred percent chance, yes. like yes. The, there's no power failure, like the, all the backups don't fail, like on the computers or whatever, like, yes. like, I think that's a, that's like an escape valve for people's arguments that are like mine, I guess, where full on. So you're saying we, we won't get to the point, let's say there's a hundred billion people at some future date and we totally solve the humans can live indefinitely. You're making the point, well, they'll still die for different reasons. Yeah. Just like there's probably not a single jellyfish that's over 10,000 years old of the ones I just described. Yes. Yeah. Because at some point they came into a life ending event that had nothing to do with their old age yes. and everything to do with some environmental cause. Yeah, you said it better so than me. So even, <laughs> what's You said that? it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it makes sense to me. So even if we get the physical body yeah. to live um, you know, indefinitely, there'll still be car accidents. Yeah. There'll still be lightning strikes. There'll still be like these freak accidents. And no matter how low a probability event it is, the longer you live, the more likely statistically you are to hit some, yeah. even though it's a low probability, some event that will end your life. Yeah, I have um, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, kind of a version of that on, on my side in this argument, just making it probabilistic in this way. Um, but, uh, you know, or, and you didn't even mention like existential threats like global warming. I think you kind of hinted at it actually, but yeah, so things like Yeah, that. If, if humans don't get rid of their technology yeah. and go extinct. And the sun explode, you know, the sun's going to go supernova. And, you know, so there's just like always, it seems like we're, we happen to live. I think just red giant. Is that, is that I what think it is? Our sun, okay, yeah. sorry. Our, yeah. our sun was, our whole solar system came from a supernova. But our sun we'll go will giant. go red giant. Okay. It will get so big that it'll swallow up Mercury and Venus for sure, uh -huh. and possibly the Earth. Uh -huh. So it'll get that big. It. I mean, it'll it'll go red giant. Yeah. So yeah, you're the physicist. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. So like, we happen to live in a universe which um, has. Uh, it's just easy for energy to spread out. It's easier for energy to spread out than stay concentrated, and so that also means that. You know, basically, it's all probabilistic kind of law that that um, it's just really unlikely that we're going to be able to construct the kind of systems that we would need to construct to keep out the bad stuff, <laughs> keep out the randomness. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and even the um, digital example. So when you store information digitally, it's stored as zeros and ones. And so the idea is that, well, that information can live on forever. But there's no storage device that uh, that we have that can just hold information in the zero and one states. So they all fail with time. Yes. And so if you store a uh, you know a photo on your hard drive, uh, there's no hard drive that's going to keep that information perfect forever. Yep. So you would need if you really wanted to keep it perfect, you'd make many copies and then you just keep recopying it. Yep. And every time you'd copy it, you'd have to inspect it for any errors. Yep. Um, so you'd have to compare the copy to another version. So just, you know, keeping things alive digitally has its own set of problems. Yeah, yeah and there's cosmic rays that flip these bits, too. <laughs> yeah. So it's not even and certainly the, to, like, to make sure that it's right at the copy stage. Like, it's going to get, you know, messed with. <laughs> we just it's, it's cool i think it's a great thing like i i, I know i used to believe that we, this is a project we should pursue like make sure people live forever but i uh yeah it's it's really interesting to think about the other side and like that take take um solace in in our own demise and and, and then then it's about then it's about then the project is not to live forever but to make the most of our life to play and use this time that we have to its fullest not to I would say when I say play I mean the play of life not to be frivolous um, but to fully open to the experience and when I say love equals attention equals mindfulness I mean be aware that you're alive in this moment and make the most of it and really enjoy it and don't don't um, yeah don't I guess uh, 
it, it would be a mistake to have too much faith, to use your word, <laughs> in, in, the, in the future, um, you know, indefinite lives of, or uh, perpetual lives, I guess I should say, of um, future people, um, or maybe... Or Living something. in perpetuity. Yeah. Well, it's certainly something, like I said earlier, I, I think you and I uh, missed that boat or dodged that bullet, depending <laughs> on the way you think about it. Yeah. Uh, we're just not in that generation that's going to be living or in perpetuity. We we might live to say 120 or 130 because, and only a fraction of us, right? Yeah. Only a fraction of us will live that long. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if people, Alive you know, right now there's there's like a couple of 120 year olds, but it's a very rare event. And I think by the time you and I are older, that event will be much more common. Yeah. And there's more humans, so even if it's not more um, even if it's the same percentage yeah. of the population, it'll still be a larger number. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much to say about, um, I was gonna say more about this idea of, like, what does it mean to live a meaningful life or uh, a good life? You know, like there's the Epicurean view that we should be just eating and drinking and being merry and, and um, that's actually- Like the hobbits. Yeah, that is not, um, I think that's wrong. I think I think it actually involves like thinking about suffering a lot. Um, is actually you you want to be Gandalf, you don't want to be uh, Bilbo. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I Gandalf. So Gandalf, tell me more. I I've never read these, but I did watch uh, the Lord of the Rings. But tell me tell me more so about this analogy. Just really quickly, you know, hobbits are seeking they're pleasure seeking beings, right? Like they're all about fun and they feel sadness, so they're they're very emotional uh -huh. creatures. Um, but when you talk about the Epicurean, you know, their lives are more simple. Yeah. And then when you talk about Gandalf, he's a wizard. So he's all about, you know, trying to unlock the mysteries of the uh -huh. universe. Yes. And he's much more intellectual and he understands that there's like these bigger powers at force. Whereas a, your typical hobbit is like not concerned Got about it. it sort of oh thing. yeah, totally. So so like the hobbits may suffer, but they're never going to understand how they're suffering or why or, or what to do about it to solve it kind of thing. But Gandalf might. Yeah, and Gandalf does. Yeah. He, he, he endures like lifetimes of suffering oh, that's great. in this one experience he does. That's so cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's so much to recommend that view, especially if you think about race and racism right now, um, the moment we're going through with Black Lives Matter. Um, this is a moment where we meditators can really um, open up to the suffering of race and racism in the world and do reading and, and actually try to make a difference um, for for the lives of people that are, are you know, we live amongst and, and are, we are friends with. And, and um, so there's just so much there's so much opportunity to open our heart to the suffering in the world, um, especially as caused by systematic racism. If we're in America right now, something bad happens in your heart too. <laughs> I think um, when, you know, personally I can say when I've just become so focused on my own interests and individualistic, um, I could say maybe an example for my life would be helpful here. So like um, I, when we were in grad school together at Berkeley, I remember a couple of years in, I just decided I needed to do something other than think about myself and my own research, <laughs> which is failing. Um, and those kinds of sick, that kind of suffering wasn't helping me create more meaning. So I volunteered at the local children's hospital in Oakland and uh, for the school program. And every Friday, I can't remember the frequency. I think it was once every Friday. Maybe it was once every other Friday. I would go and um, and that would be the highlight of my week um, to just be with students they were struggling and I was able to give them some normalcy, helping them think about homework. It's funny to think homework could be therapeutic, but when your life is so upside down and you're in a hospital and you, you can't go home, that normalcy of like working on some math um, is like, is really good for this, the kids and good for your soul. Like when you feel like you're making some contact, oh, you know, and so. Yeah. And Harvey, you and I came from very different backgrounds. Uh, for me, I think one of the reasons I did well in school academically is because I loved the escapism that academia provided and homework was one example of that escapism. Huh. So it, it, just a quick example yeah, is my dad would my dad would work on cars and he was almost inevitably terrible when he worked on cars. He would curse, he would be mean, he would be nasty. 
And I found pretty quickly that I was like, there's no gain and all loss to work with dad on the cars, right? Like, there's no benefit to this. And so, uh, you know, when he asked me to work on cars, like homework was this golden thing that I could, oh, actually, dad, I've got to do homework. <laughs> and I don't think I was consciously aware at that time. Like, I don't think I was consciously making a decision, oh, I'm going to do homework in order to avoid dad. I think it was much more subconscious in the sense that like, oh, this homework, I want to get this done. And then when I, once I was in the homework, I was totally escaping into it. Yeah. So I can definitely relate to the idea of homework being a therapeutic thing yeah, and, cool. and very much a fun thing. And, um, you know, escapism is probably not a good MO for all of your life events. But for me at that time, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to escape. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was wonderful to escape. My poor brother... You know, he would help my dad, and, yeah. and I don't think it benefited his health yeah. to to be a part of that because yeah. my dad was just, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, things didn't go well, you know. Yeah, I, I don't know that. if you've worked on cars much, but generally you hurt yourself and you break things and, you know, it, it doesn't all go perfectly like you hope. Yeah. No, that's a great, and this is, that's a great connecting this is, thread. It's important for me to not care as much about my own, that riskiness for myself and uh, w with the hope that if I'm willing to push myself and learn and and have these difficult conversations, um, I can maybe make the world a better place. Yeah, and I think we're in a world where we need change. I mean, I think that, that maybe that's all the viewers won't agree, but um, I think, you know, like consider a school, I think on at, in the aggregate, 80% of the teaching workforce is white and something like 30, I can't, I'm gonna get these numbers wrong, maybe it's 45, some percentage, way less than 80% of students are white. And so you get this situation where on average, the typical school has more white teachers than is representative of their, um, of their classrooms. And so, you know, that may or may not be a problem, but it's certainly something to look at, you know, like if your school has 16% of the teachers are teachers of color, but 42% of the student body is students of color like my school is. Um, and that's, you know, that's not atypical. Um, you know, my view is let's, what can we do to get really great teachers of color? And yeah, I don't know, that might trigger somebody um, but in the, you know, the, as much, I've thought about it a lot and I think that the, in, in balance, it's more beneficial to see the curriculum that students, so if I'm a student, it's, it's more beneficial for me to, in the curriculum and the faces that I look at, it's more beneficial to, for me to be able to see myself in the stories that I read, um, and to see my totally to see myself as a possible teacher one day and, you know, or a person in, in a respectable job. And so I, I think like, I don't know, like that's an example. It's just like to pick one. So I, I want to come back to a question related to what yeah. you're talking about, but first great. I want to have a little bit of a lighthearted question. Yeah. Great. What's a characteristic or quality you have that gets you into trouble? <laughs> <laughs> These are so related. Uh, um, yeah, you know what? Uh, I am, I don't know if I'm an iconoclast, um, but historically that's meant people who kind of blow up cherished or sacred things. Um, I don't know if I'm exactly an iconoclast, but I have uh, some traits that rhyme with that. <laughs> uh, I don't really care what other people think of me. Uh, I am agreeable, I think. I'm probably more agreeable than disagreeable, but when I believe something, I don't really care what people think about how, <laughs> you know, so that's probably... So that trait gets you into a lot of trouble. I, I get into trouble with that. I, I yeah. think, you know, I read a book, uh, Richard Feynman wrote, wrote either an essay or a book with the title what do you care what other people think of you or something like that? Um, he's the Caltech professor that inspired a lot of people with his biographies. They're probably, I don't know how well they've aged because there's some womanizing in there, but um, uh, he's just a really interesting person, no matter what you think about him. 
you're going to get something from reading his books. And um, uh, I read his biographies at a young age, and I was pretty convinced that there's something to that approach that, you know, if you feel like you're, something is right and you've thought about it a lot, you might as well represent that view in the world and you may piss off some people. But Yeah, and I think Feynman and Steve Jobs had a couple of similarities. Uh, for example, one thing I got from reading Feynman's, uh, surely you're mis joking, Mr. Feynman, is that he appreciated, he really liked to figure out stuff for himself. And I can relate to that because whenever I studied with a study group and I kind of relied on someone else to help me solve a problem, I generally didn't understand it nearly as well as when I sort of forced myself through that struggle of figuring out it on my own. And Richard Feynman, he definitely impressed upon his readers that that was his go-to, is that he didn't idolize anyone or make it seem like anyone was super smart. He just would plod along and try to figure it out for him in a way that made sense to him. And he made it make sense in this beautiful way to a lot of other people because he made it really simple. He didn't hide behind big words. He would be able to describe things so well because he understood them so well. Uh, and Steve Jobs certainly mimicked that. Like Steve Jobs didn't think there was any wizards out there. He just thought, oh, you know, anything that's been created was created by someone no smarter than you or me. Yeah. And um, I thought that was a cool similarity be between the two of them. <laughs> if you tell Harvey you have a button, Harvey will push it. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's value to that, right? Like yeah. that probably gets you in trouble sometimes. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of cool because a lot of therapists suggest that if you have a button, that that's related to some trauma or yeah, that's or the something. cognitive behavioral therapist idea, right? Like you should you should actually expose yourself to those allergens so that you don't be become so you're no longer allergic. And uh, some therapists say that you you subconsciously keep putting yourself in a position to expose yourself. Whether you deal with it or not is up to mm. you, but like if you find yourself, oh, every every person I date has this character trait, it's, well, guess what? It's it's because you have a trauma and you're subconsciously <laughs> yeah. seeking someone to push that button for you. Yeah, you need to find a new solution to being in that dynamic. Uh, yes. So you maybe you keep running through it, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. So right. a, a great example is, um, I talked about this in another video I made, Harvey, is I had a really tough time responding to people being angry with me yeah. And so, of course, all my relationships had that. Yeah. Uh, but the beauty was, like, I was subconsciously drawn to people who would be angry with me at times. And, I would, <laughs> and it, was, it was all so that I could deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you achieved more equanimity in that, on that axis, Sam? Oh, God, yes. And, and I also achieved a lot more gray hair uh, <laughs> as, as I, I worked through that. I can't see it in this that. video. Uh, it, I... I got a lot of gray hair after my father died and uh -huh. then I got a lot more gray hair after I worked on trying to experience that feeling with less of a trauma response and more of a being present and more tuning into what I was experiencing but it took months you know it wasn't yeah, like sure. an easy process and it you know it was so much trauma related to that feeling that I think it it did gray quite a bit of my hair <laughs> Well, but you yes, look good. You're I, you're one of these foxes now. What are they called? Silver fox. Great, silver fox. Yeah, you're a silver fox. So then, this comes back to the question. Uh, you were talking about Black Lives Matter, and you were yeah. talking about change. So let's just give you a magic wand, and mm. you you could magically change anything you want about humanity, government, society, societal beliefs, the state of our world. You can just magically change something. So it's not about like, hey, what do we do specifically to change this? It's not about the how. It's what if you, you know, were some fantastical creature that could just create change, what change would you want to create? I'm sure it's a long list, so let's just Jeez. let's just pick one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I do you, you're so generous. You gave me your questions ahead of time and I uh, still didn't come up with an answer to this one, but I'll let me think. Um, you know, is it is it is it wrong to want people to be able to laugh more? I don't know. I, I feel like um, there's a way that living is joyful. And I feel like, you know, maybe it's my privilege. It could be um, that I've just been so lucky to live the life that I've got, that I had 
a chance to live so far. Um, it, I, I think laughing, laughing at pain, not at, but with the pain of life, laughing with the suffering, you know, finding the joy as we work, uh, to solve, not, not in a, not in a dismissive or, um, diminutive way. Like we don't want to diminish people's suffering by our laughter, but can we, can we sit with it? Can we, can we face our mortality and the mortality of those we love and still laugh, right? Still, still see the beauty of our lives. Um, there's this great book called the book of joy, uh, written by, um, Desmond Tutu and, uh, the Dalai Lama. It's their conversation. And these are two people who have had very, I mean, they have not had privileged lives. Um, uh, very difficult moments that Dalai Lama was exiled, is, is still in exile uh, from his homeland. Um, Desmond Tutu was involved in a huge truth and reconciliation. Uh, well, first apartheid and then ex- all of, you know, all the pain of racism in his society and then the truth and reconciliation that... Um, he helped to uh, bring, like, heal the wounds of of South Africa, um, and uh, these are two people who have immense joy, and they laugh, and they they've confronted the world. You, no one would say they've been weak or cowardly or run away from the problems uh, that they faced. And they're two of the most um, deep, soulful, um, caring, fun, funny people that you'll hear talk to each other. Um, and so I don't know if it's, I don't know if I'm onto anything there, but I think there's something about seeing, sitting with stillness um, in the face of the tragedy of our lives, um, the fact that all the things we've talked about, right, racism, the, the, our own eventual death, the separation of our loved ones, um, the fact that we're imperfect and, and as humans we continually make the same mistakes over and over again, again you know, even the best of us, you know, and, and still be able to laugh and still be able to see the beauty in life and the humor of it and the poignancy and the full spectrum of emotions, but I think something about laughter and the joy, joyful laughter, um, that's one That's one category. I don't know if, yeah, if that's a good answer. There's three examples I want to share with you, and, and I'm going to confine it to joy. I know you're talking about laughter, but I'm going to confine it to joy, yeah. and I can get into that uh, if, if you want me to. But yeah, yeah, no, no. Let's, talk, just, let's talk about joy. So let's talk about joy because I think that's the that's the element. Like laughter, if it leads to joy, is what you're after. Not uh, yeah, not like laughter. a full joyful belly laugh. Like, like the yeah yeah. Like but it, I mean, if you're like laughing at someone else's not pain, not at someone's misfortune. Yeah yeah. But no, you're no. talking about I think something that like, leads to joy. Yeah, like sort of like you could imagine. Maybe the scenario is something like, uh, and you, I'd love to. I want to hear. I don't want to pause you very much longer. But it's there's some there's a top there's a, something called sympathetic joy. Um, there's a few, there's a few ideas. Uh, you're, so, uh, I don't want to get, do you, have you heard of Schaden, Schadenfreude? Yes. The, Schadenfreude so like, is the, like, joy at someone else's misfortune. Yeah. So it's the opposite of Schadenfreude. It's like the joy at someone's good fortune. So what's tip, what typically we do is we cut, we go into ourselves and we say, why does he have the Corvette, not me? Yeah, there, and, there's even a word that we've invented, and it's recent. It's If you look it up online, it's not like in a dictionary, but it is out there. It's called compersion. Compersion. Okay, okay. I haven't heard this before. And it's not quite the opposite of schadenfreude. It's joy at someone else's, uh, you know, well, well-being, or, yep. you know, someone else has something good happen to their life, exactly. and you feel a, this sympathetic joy. This is what we need more of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so compersion, like, it's, it's a new word, you know. I love it. But I love it. Uh, the three examples I was thinking of when you brought up the joy is one is Namibia. Um, I dated a woman who did Peace Corps in Namibia. And one of the things that she talked about that was her experience of joy even w- with poverty, 
right? So she was around a lot of relative poverty, poverty in uh, the U.S. terms, right? And so she's around that, but she was like, people were so joyful. And she saw people smiling so much more than in the U.S. And Ronnie Chang is a comedian who came from China. And one of the bits that he does is about how much, you know, the U.S. is the promised land. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people in China kind of seek to get into the U.S. And it's not just true of China, right? Around the world, a lot of people saw the U.S. or see the U.S. as sort of a promised land. And then Ronnie Chang's experience is by the time he got here, you know, he went to New York City and he's like, everyone just complained all the time. You know, there wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't the joy. And that was certainly my experience of New York is like, you don't see a lot of joy in people's faces. When you look, if you go to New York City and you just walk down the road and you look at every human's face, you're not gonna see a lot of joy. The face that they hold from moment to moment doesn't hold a lot of joy. Whereas what uh, the woman I, um, who was in Namibia, what she experienced was the faces held joy at just yeah. normal times. And the third example I was, wanted to give is um, there's North Korean defectors. And one of the women, you know, she hated North Korea. There was no part of it that she just hated the government. She hated the lies. They knew they were being lied to. And she tells stories that are just horrific. But one thing she comes back to is even within that context, people were joyful. They found joy. And... Uh, so I think this speaks something how even societies that have uh, different fortunes than we have um, find ways to have joy. And yeah. your, I think your experience is mostly in the U.S. Yes. And so you're, if you could wave your magic wand, it would be to allow, you know, when you walk down New York City, just people's faces to have joy in them and, and that right. to reflect an inner joy. Yeah, and I think it, I don't know exactly how I may do the magic, but there's something about compassion pa practices, loving kindness meditations, um, equanimity meditations, sympathetic joy meditations. Um, Sharon Salzberg talks a lot about this in her books, and uh, she also is a teacher on the 10% Happier app that I've been practicing with, and uh, there's a whole course on 10% Nicer, it's called. Um, but yeah, could I, could I may wave a magic wand that basically the result is um basically could i give everyone ten thousand hours of compassion practice <laughs> so that they're just more joyful and that you know in in the face of these these difficulties and in the face of the happinesses right there's there's a lot of things to celebrate <laughs> and we often forget to when we see you know, it's easy to, like I was just saying, so you see a Corvette and why aren't we jumping up and down for the joy that that person's feeling instead of thinking like, why don't I have a Corvette? You know, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to see joy in life and maybe give people the glasses so that they can, they can wear them all the time with my magic wand. Well, I think you and I talked about this in grad school. There was one guy who, he was a student at Stanford and he would play basketball with his friends and then he would see, I don't know, a BMW or some car that he really wanted that would pull up and it would be some alum who like, and he'd see them get out of the car and then he was like, oh, I can't wait to be that guy because he was this poor <laughs> college student. Yeah. And then he became that guy. So he became very wealthy and when he was much older, he was driving the BMW and he was on the outside and he was looking in and seeing these young kids playing volleyball, these college kids. And he thought, oh man, I just, I wish I was playing, or not volleyball, sorry, basketball. It's like, oh, I wish I was that kid. So he was on both sides of the window and looking and kind of wishing <laughs> to be on the other side. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, I don't know. How have others answered that question of uh, the wand? That's a hard one. Oh, oh, um, and then you had a question for me, I think. You, you asked, you wanted to ask me a question, oh, yeah. I blew past uh, it. Yeah, yeah, I had, I guess all of these, I want to know your answer, I'm so interested. Um, There's a specific so, one, though. The one, the one that you just, we just talked about. What um, personality trait gets me into the most trouble? Yeah, I'm curious about that. Let me guess, actually, first. All right. Do you have an answer already? Uh, I'll think of one. Okay, think of one, and let me also... No one ever asked me my own questions, I... <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, 
I have one possible answer now for you. Yeah, I would say a personality trait that gets me in a lot of trouble is based on misunderstanding. Uh, I'm definitely not a devil's advocate, and I try not to counterpoint, right? Mm -hmm. But I think I come across that way sometimes. Uh -huh. And it's not intentional, and I think it comes back to um, people not hearing what I'm saying, but mm -hmm. making making inferences that are incorrect. But they've made the inference, so it's in their head. Um, a great example is someone will post a headline or post a story, and the headline will just be non-truthful. It'll be garbage, yes. right? Yeah. And like it'll clickbait. be, yeah, and and it'll be you know something about Trump that's a lie. And and oh, that's not a headline anymore. <laughs> well, and I, what I don't like about that is, I, I don't like the spread of misinformation because it's yeah. much easier to create lies, right? You and I could come up with ten conspiracy theories in an hour, right? No problem. Easy. But it would take us months and months and months and probably millions of dollars of research to debunk those same ten conspiracy theories. Like, it's really hard to debunk them. It's really easy to create them. Of course, yeah. Uh, where was I going with that? Oh, so how does that get you into trouble? Um, when, you're oh. a when you're perceived to be a devil's advocate, I guess. Was that where you're headed? No, no, just about the Trump oh, headline. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. So I'll call out and I'll tell someone, like, this headline is garbage, right? And someone <laughs> will infer incorrectly that I'm a Trump supporter. And, you know, they've been dying to talk down to a Trump supporter because they're reading all these things about Trump supporters, like Trump supporters are all these bad things, and now they have access to one because they assume I'm a Trump supporter. Yeah, I've said really nothing. you really are a devil's advocate if you're supporting Trump. Yeah. Well, I've never said anything to support I'm Trump. Kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just calling out this garbage headline as, hey, this is totally a lie or it's misleading or it's propaganda. Which yeah. there's plenty of that on both sides, right? Sure, like, of course. Yeah. There's Breitbart and Infowars and Fox News for the Republicans, and then there's uh, there's De Occupy Democrats and yep. CNN News for the Democrats, and they're both biased reporting. Yep. And then there is some more factual reporting, but by me calling out like, "Hey, this is propaganda," someone's like, "Oh, this guy's a Trump supporter." Yeah. And so that gets me in a lot of trouble, but it's not because they've paid attention to me as a human. It's because they've been waiting to find one of these ugly yeah. Trump supporters that you're they keep the reading about. Yeah, you're waving the wrong flag in their eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so they, they'll pounce, and then yeah. I'm like, uh, where are you getting this from? You know, like, <laughs> if you read my words, there's no part where I'm like, oh, Trump's this saint who's gonna save us all, or, you know, there's yeah, nothing yeah. pro-Trump. All I've done is said, this is a lie, that's it. Yeah. And it's true, and then I, I'll have links that have backed up my statement. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's so your I, that's your that's your middle finger. <laughs> well, I don't hesitate to to call out <laughs> lies, and that's not being a devil's advocate, right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're pointing you're a truth out, advocate. yes, very much a truth advocate, and that that can get you in trouble because people yeah. make inferences. Yeah. It's like, oh, don't believe these lies about Trump equates somehow to being a Trump supporter, and I'm like, yeah. that that's a leap of logic that's incorrect. It's yeah. a it's a possibly true, but not necessarily true. That's great. I love it. And did you, how, how would you wave your wand? Would you just take all those people who don't understand you and put them into some kind of camp somewhere? Ooh, if I could wave a, <laughs> if I could wave a magic wand, I would wave a magic wand for our government to be reasonably efficient and have zero corruption if I had a magic wand because I believe that all governments have both corruption and inefficiency yeah and I don't believe for a second you know the the Democrat um, the the runners for the Democratic Party uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were very much hey we're gonna rob from the rich and give to the poor we're gonna be the Robin Hood Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are both like we're gonna get the wealthy corporations to give us money that we're then gonna give to you that was their message. You know, hey, we're going to pay for your college and it's going to come from these rich corporations. And I didn't believe that for a second because the rich corporations own the government. So uh, if you have these people who come in with their ideals, at least they get the conversations. So there's value there. Uh, yeah. Like if Elizabeth Warren were our president, 
she'd be having these discussions, she'd sign executive orders, there'd be these things happening that, that would be awesome. Um, but I think the reality is the corporations, the wealthy corporations own our government. And so there's this one. intrinsic corruption that's happening. And I yep. think the federal government is contributing to the increasing wealth and income inequality. So that gap between the wealthiest and the, the mean or the average person, that gap is growing. And I think the federal government is being used to make that grow faster. Yeah, and that's a really, that's a good answer. And so I think I if think we- I think you might get more joyful people if your wand was raised, waved in that way. So yeah, and good. it's a hard problem to solve. And you know, I think that's where communism is like, it's a failed experiment because you yeah. had corruption, right? You had inefficiency and corruption. Yeah. But if you could create a corrupt, corruption-free and fairly efficient government, then I think most government types actually would work. Like you, you wouldn't have to depend on a specific type of government. It would just, it would work. So you would wave your wand for the whole world or just the U.S.? Oh heck, for the whole universe. Like any Love governing it. body anywhere, oh, that's if good. you could reduce the corruption and the inefficiency, I mean, to me that would be awesome. That sounds great. Um, and until I, you get the dictator, the the malevolent dictator who you made just made more efficient. <laughs> but he wouldn't be corrupt, right? Oh, I see. Corrupt, so, yeah. So zero corruption would be my magic wand, and then fairly efficient. So it, like maybe not a hundred percent efficiency. But, you know, if if I give a dollar to our government, how much of that goes back to helping people, right? Yeah, so I don't question. know if a penny comes back or two cents or whatever. But I'd love like 80 cents of that dollar to come back to helping more than yeah. more than hurting. That's good. I like it. That's really good. Well, Harvey, we're we're approaching probably the end of this call, and uh, I very much look forward to our future calls because I love ha uh, how we get into these things. But maybe yeah. we can part ways on one last kind of fun question. Great, I love it. Unless there's something specific you wanted to talk about. I, the only one that I had, I'm curious if it's the one you were about to raise, is um, the friendship question um, you asked. Oh, what do you what? value most in a friendship? Yeah, I thought that was a good one. Yeah, let's end on that note. Well, what were you going to ask? That, no, that's perfect, because I was just looking at my list. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I, um, it's interesting. I'm a parent now, as you saw earlier, and... Um, we parents get really worked up about how much impact we have on our kids. And <laughs> the more I realize, like the more I'm a parent and the more I read, like the more I realize, like we don't really have much of an impact at all. I don't think, um, we have, we have, of course we have an impact, but it's more like, you know, like the impact of like not having smog or it's like, you can still live with smog. Um, um, if you're a good parent, maybe you can reduce the smog a little bit. Um, but, um, it, uh, metaphorically speaking, um, but I do the the impact that friends have, I think, is profound, and um, the value of friendship for me is the positive peer pressure that a good friend can provide. And Sam, this allows me to thank you, actually, um, without getting too mushy. Um, I love you, man, and um, you have pushed me ever since I met you, uh, ever since you were rubbing my foot um, with your foot. <laughs> On the beneath the table, uh, in my house in Mira Vista Drive. Accident, um, by the way, accident. <laughs> um, that was a great story. We should tell probably. Um, but um, no, I mean, you just pushed me to be a better person all the time through our conversations, um, through uh, the example that you live, um, through the kind of person you are, um, through the genuine and authentic ways that you go about your business and your in your life and um i think um positive peer pressure of good friendships is is uh I'm, i've been lucky that you're not the only friend that i can say that about right like just we become great people to the extent that we have great friends i believe and um i think it's really the through positive peer pressure and i i um yeah, I guess I just want to thank you. I love you so much, and uh, it's just so great that you're in my life. So um, that's what I would say. I'm happy that we talked about friendship. Wow. Well, thank you. On that note, I would write back at you. One, I uh, love you very much. Two, 
uh, the positive peer pressure. You know, I'll think about some really heady stuff and then I'll have a phone call with you and you'll have read three books on similar <laughs> subjects and you'll have listened to podcasts and uh, read articles and you have all this stuff that you're interested and intrigued by and I'll be like, oh my gosh, I've, <laughs> I totally haven't gone nearly as deep as this good friend of mine has. And so then I'll, it'll encourage me to sort of double down and, and try to go a little bit further and try to go to another level of understanding of some of these concepts that I'm intrigued by. Uh, so I very much right back at you, man. Thank you very much for all, all that uh, you are as a being and, and all the ways you inspire. You're great, Sam. Thank you. Um, do you, do you know of a better answer to that question about friendship? I, oh. While you think of it, I wanted to say one more thing. Um, okay. As evidence for my earlier claim about how little parents impacts, how, how small the impact of a parent is compared to friends, uh, I would just ask the listeners to, to think about the, um, the accent that, that children end up having. Um, they, they never inherit the, the accent of their parents. Say if, you know, uh, right now I'm, I'm, at, I'm at my wife's uh, parents' house. They're, they were born and raised in India. Um, my wife was born and raised in America. She has a Chicago accent. <laughs> um, she doesn't have the, you know, an, a Telugu American accent. Um, so, I mean, that's just one example, uh, one data point in the direction of the, the power of the influence that friends have um, with respect to, you know, in relation to the, the power yeah, the, the impact that parents have. The extreme is, I, I think this is a Chinese proverb, where I heard it from someone's mom who was Chinese, and she said that you're the average of your five friends, five closest oh, friends. That's good. And I'm not sure I believe that, but there's certainly some truth to that. Something right? there, yeah. Yeah, that something there. you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, I think would be probably more accurate. Um, but yeah, whoever you're spending time with, you're picking up their mannerisms, whether you want to or not, right? You might hate a mannerism of somebody, but if you're around them enough, you'll probably pick up some aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're sending that question back to me. What do I value in friendship? Or, or, or you know, what have you heard as a good answer, if not your own personal answer? But No, no, no. I, I'm going to answer for me. Yeah, um, good. And it's related to an earlier concept that we were talking about. So I very much value changing my beliefs, right? I remember some kids when I was younger, they were like, Sam, these beliefs are who I am. And, you know, I'm never going to change them no matter what. And they were proud of that. And I'm very much proud of the opposite, that, that my beliefs aren't who I am. My beliefs are what I've created. And to me, something I value in friendship is someone who can help me with the discovery process of getting rid of limiting beliefs, getting rid of beliefs that are probably creating a, a worse life experience for me and exchanging them for beliefs that are maybe more beneficial to me or to the people around me or in some way to society or the universe and you know swapping out these beliefs it, it's hard to find someone who can help you challenge yourself on certain beliefs and I constantly on the search for that um, and I, I value that in a friend where I can you know work through some of those beliefs with a friend and that's certainly what you and I did in grad school we we went to the gym uh, almost every day and it allowed us a ton of time to talk through different things. And, you know, we, d we did do some chit chat, but I think it was mostly like deeper stuff. That's and right. I very much value that. I call it a growth process, a learning process. Um, but it's, it's this idea to me that, hey, what I believe today is not the truth. What I believe today is what I believe today. That's and right. I'm totally open to finding a better set of beliefs and you know, better is open to interpretation. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, I'd very much put that in the category of one of the things I value most about friendship is someone who can help me become a better human. That's and great. part of that means having better belief system that's, that's more beneficial to me and the people I love and society as a whole. It's so good. Which is part of the reason for this YouTube channel, right? This yeah. whole well-being thing. Which, by the way, if you're getting anything out of these videos, the thumbs up is really helpful. Um, hit subscribe if you want to go to other videos like this. And your comments are really helpful because then it helps Harvey and I know what, uh, what you found useful about this video. Or perhaps your own beliefs or you want to weigh in with your own ideas of what you value in a friendship. 
uh, the comments would be a great place for that. Well, thanks again, Harvey. I'll let you get back to your, <laughs> your mother-in-law and uh, you're there with your wife, your two daughters, your mother-in-law, right. anyone else? Uh, and father-in-law, you said father and mother-in-law. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. And, um, we, um, yeah, Chicago's great. It's, uh, it's fun. It's, it's great to have, yeah. Speaking of peer pressure, it's good to have, um, more adults in your life during the pandemic to help watch your children and be influences on them. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, but thank you, Sam, so much. Um, I'll be curious to see how this goes. I'll edit out whatever you want. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for having me on. All right. Thanks, Harvey. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.